This place, the Mount, was home to Edith Wharton for just 10 years, but in that very decade of her life, she developed fully into the woman the world would come to know as one of America's greatest authors. Toward the end of her life, she would write, the Mount was my first real home. Its blessed influence still lives with me. For Wharton, the Mount was actually more than her first real home. It was something she herself had created for her own use, an achievement that ultimately helped her gain the confidence and determination to chart her own course. Edith Wharton was 40 years old when she took up residence at the Mount. She was christened Edith Newbold Jones when she was born in 1862 into the small, tight, privileged class known as Old New York. It was a society made up of polite and complacent people who shunned the intellectual and did little else besides travel and socialize with each other. The Jones family was well off but not immensely rich like their cousins the Astors. They moved to Europe when Edith was four years old. They traveled extensively throughout Germany, Spain, France, and Italy for six of the most impressionable years of their young daughter's life. Edith Jones was a lonely but profoundly curious child, and thus she was overjoyed when, upon the family's return to New York, she was given access to the kingdom, as she described it, of her father's library at age 10. In her memoir, A Backward Glance, she recalls spending hours there, quote, squatting on a thick turkey rug and pulling open one after another the glass doors of the low bookcases and dragging out book after book in a secret ecstasy of communion. Reading inspired her to write, and by the time she was 16, she had finished her first novel and had a poem published in the Atlantic Monthly. Edith Jones dutifully married Edward Robbins Wharton when she was 23. Teddy, as he was called, was a sportsman, and she was an intellectual. From the very beginning, their union was a mismatch. Their only shared interest was a love of animals and of nature in general. Even still, for the next 15 years, Edith Wharton consigned herself to the life of a young society matron. She divided her time between houses in Newport and New York and routinely traveled to Europe, most often to Italy. Henry James would later observe that in marrying Teddy, Edith had done an almost, or rather an utterly, inconceivable thing. In the late 19th century, one of the few creative outlets afforded a woman in polite society was the opportunity to decorate her own home. Wharton approached the task seriously, and soon thereafter, drawing upon her developing writing skills, she took the art of decorating a great step further. In 1897, she published her first major book, The Decoration of Houses, co-authored with Ogden Codman, Jr., who was a young Boston architect just starting out in his career. The authors advocated good taste and common sense when designing a house. In place of the cluttered look of the prevailing Victorian style, they recommended looking to the clean lines of classical architecture for inspiration. The book is still in print today, and the authors are recognized as having established interior design as a profession in this country. Wharton visited the Berkshires in the late 1890s and immediately began making plans to move there. The truth is that I'm in love with the place, climate, scenery, life, and all, she wrote to a friend. She purchased a large farm in Lenox overlooking Laurel Lake and named it The Mount, after her great-grandfather's house on Long Island. From site selection to design, construction and furnishings, Wharton was completely involved in the building of her house. Others did assist. Her niece, landscape gardener Beatrix Farron, designed the approach. Architect Francis L. V. Hoppen drew up plans, and her friend and colleague Ogden Codman helped with the interiors. But ultimately, the Mount was Wharton's creation. Her genius lay in successfully adapting the best of what she had seen in Europe to her American soil, creating a house and garden in perfect harmony with art and nature. Work began on the estate in early 1901, and the Whartons were able to move in by September 1902. Their spacious and dignified house combines elements Wharton admired in French, Italian, and English architecture, including an embracing forecourt, an elegant gallery, and perfectly proportioned rooms. 
All the principal rooms open on to a wide, sunny terrace that wraps around the north and east sides of the house and overlooks the gardens. Wharton viewed her gardens as extensions of interior spaces or outdoor rooms. She was greatly influenced by the European garden she had studied in depth, but she never lost sight of the Mount's American setting. She believed that, quote, each step away from the house should be a nearer approach to nature, and this is clearly evident at the Mount, where descending grass terraces act as a transition from the formal architecture of the house to the shifting informal lines of the landscape beyond. When compared to similar country manors built in this era, the Mount was modest in both size and cost. In stark contrast to the palatial excesses found in the other so-called cottages of the Gilded Age, the stately but functional elegance of Edith Wharton's house proves that money and taste do not necessarily go hand in hand. The Mount also demonstrates that Wharton understood architecture, decoration, and gardens far better than many of the fashionable designers of her day. Wharton's time at the Mount was, for the most part, richly diverse and fulfilling. She devoted her mornings to writing in the privacy of her bedroom. It was in this sanctum that she wrote the book that would change her life, The House of Mirth. Published in 1905, this novel became an immediate, record-breaking bestseller, and her identity as one of America's leading authors was firmly established. Although writing occupied her mornings, Wharton's afternoons were dedicated to a wide range of interests, including photography and exploring the surrounding countryside in her new motor car. She derived particular pleasure from her gardens, and she enjoyed entertaining the literary and intellectual friends who came to stay, foremost among them Henry James. Of his visits to the Mount, James fondly recalled being surrounded by, quote, every loveliness of nature and every luxury of art, and being treated with a benevolence that brings tears to my eyes. The Mount's role in Edith Wharton's life ended abruptly in 1911, when her troubled marriage collapsed under the strain of her husband's ever-increasing erratic behavior. As a divorced professional writer, Edith Wharton no longer had a place in the conservative society of her upbringing. She moved to Paris where she found an intellectual and social haven. She lived the remainder of her life in France and spent those final 25 years working tirelessly, both as an author and as a humanitarian. When the First World War broke out, Wharton threw herself into relief work, aiding civilian refugees and wounded soldiers. For her extraordinary efforts, she was named a Chevalier of the Legion of Honor in 1916, one of the few such awards made by the French government to a civilian during that time. Wharton wrote over 40 books in 40 years, and in 1921, she became the first woman to receive the Pulitzer Prize for fiction for her celebrated novel, The Age of Innocence. Before her death in 1937, she also became the first woman to receive an honorary doctorate from Yale University and the first woman to attain full membership in the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She had earned her place in the pantheon of the world's great writers. In the decades that followed Wharton's departure from the Berkshires, the Mount was occupied by a succession of owners, the most extended residency being that of the Fox Hollow School for Girls, which owned the property from 1942 to 1976. Over the course of time, the buildings deteriorated and the gardens grew wild or disappeared altogether. Edith Wharton Restoration purchased the estate in 1980. Through the painstaking research of scholars and archaeologists, the hard work of highly skilled artisans, and the generosity of friends from around the world, restoration began in earnest in 1997. Since then, significant portions of the house and gardens have been restored. But there is still much to do before it is returned to what Henry James described as an exquisite and marvelous place, a monument to the impeccable taste of its so accomplished mistress. A watershed moment in the restoration effort occurred in early 2006 when Edith Wharton's lifelong collection of more than 2,600 books was returned to her library. This unique treasure includes books that date from her earliest childhood to those she was collecting at the time of her death. These books are a window on her intellectual development and evolution as a writer. Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, for example, was clearly one of her most treasured volumes. Given to her by Walter Barry, who she declared was the greatest love of her life, 
Her numerous markings within show how deeply this groundbreaking book affected her. The acquisition of this extraordinary collection represents the return of Edith Wharton's intellectual spirit to the Mount. Only 5% of National Historic Landmarks are dedicated to women. The Mount is one of them. It is also the only monument dedicated to Edith Wharton in her native country. This sole American tribute to her accomplishments is an ideal expression of her brilliance. Here at the Mount, one experiences the writer, the designer, the gardener, the intellectual, and the warm and lively hostess wrapped into one. It is here that you will be able to appreciate the full extent of Edith Wharton's genius.